people that say, oh, well, I can't meditate because my mind's too crazy. I just have thoughts and I just keep thinking. It's like, well, yeah, it's actually very natural to keep thinking. And what, what I'm trying to show and what mindfulness shows is that you can't stop that thought from arising even if I paid you a million pounds. That thought's going to arise. But when it does arise, you can A, train your skill of awareness. Ah, I've noticed the thought arising. Okay, that's one part of the learning. And the second part is now that I notice it, I can do something about it, which I never knew existed before. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Faster Podcast. And today, I have a very interesting guest because it's not the kind of guest that we usually have. It's much more interesting in my opinion because we're going to talk about a subject that's very, very near and dear to me and that's very important in my life and that is mindfulness. So today we're joined with Guy from Mindful News UK. So Guy, tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for, for doing this. It's always interesting to do, to do a carpool podcast. And by the way, this is something I was not aware of, but Guy was actually an OG of Car Podcast that's been doing it for how many years now? When was your first episode well, of? About seven years, my first Car Podcast. You see, people were telling me how new this concept is, and I was like, no, people have done it before, seven years ago. So anyway, back to what it is that you do. So I'm a mindfulness coach, and by that, I've been working with athletes, specifically fighters, um, to help with stress, increase confidence and just understand how do we be present it's not it's a word that we hear thrown around quite a lot now nowadays but it's we spend so much time thinking we don't even realize it and a lot of that is suffering we have negative thoughts so it's my role to help people understand that at the core rather than solving these little issues about stress reduction and, and confidence it's like well why is it that we're stressed why is it that we lack confidence and try and hit that at the core and in that journey, people start to learn not only how to resolve their problems, but learn how to learn who they are at the core, you know, beyond the judgments and the self-doubts and the comparisons. And so I've been in the corporate world for 16 years in a software company, and it was last July that I was in a position to leave that role and now make it a full time, full time job helping people with mindfulness and, you know, for me, that's that's now what I enjoy doing. It's helping others. So mindfulness is a word that, of course, we hear a lot. It's becoming more and more popular, but I think it's still a word that can cause a lot of confusion for people, a lot of misunderstanding. So what is mindfulness? The big question. Yeah, and it's a great question because it's one that every time I explain it, it evolves because it's like, you know, what is love? What is sex? It's very difficult to to describe in words, but it's something that we learn from experience and practicing it. So I just want to caveat that by saying that there are people that are interesting to understand what it is, is to actually try it. So mindfulness is the skill of being in the present moment. And by that, I mean being deliberate. So let's say, let's, let's take some examples. You're in bed at night and you're trying to go to sleep, but you have thoughts in your mind. And for most people, when they're having thoughts, it's like, okay, well, too bad. I'm just going to be a prisoner. And when they eventually go away or when I eventually fall asleep, that's, that's how that's going to resolve itself. Whereas mindfulness is the skill to notice that when a thought arises, you can apply a technique or a remediation where you almost like popping a soap bubble. You can just pop that thought and then bring yourself back to an anchor, whether it's your breath, or whether it's you know a conversation or the Netflix movie that you that you're watching but it's the skill to notice when you are in thought and then redirect that attention to something deliberate to the present moment to to you know the conversation you're having with your family or for people in the office when they they're worried about a presentation the night before it's like well why should you let a future event affect that that you affect the way that you're feeling today it's not and it's something that you know we can get into about the evolutionary reasons why why it is that is but you know so for me mindfulness is a skill that when we're lost in thought to bring ourselves back to the present moment do you think it's a skill that's becoming more and more lost in 
so of our current society because of the amount of distractions that are being thrown at us every day. Because I've noticed myself personally is that like we before the podcast, we were speaking about how a lot of entrepreneurs now have to do a lot of business from their phone, which means a lot of the time back in the olden days, maybe I'm obviously I'm quite young, but I still remember the times where phones were not very entertaining. You know, I remember the old Nokia's maybe had one game on it, but it wasn't something yeah, that you were that you would sit in on for eight hours a day, which is what some people's screen time is nowadays. So do you think this is a something that's becoming a problem that, you know, people might not realize even? Yeah, I don't think it's becoming a problem. I think it has been a problem for such a long time. And I don't know where along human evolution that was lost. But I've been working with over 100 people. And, and one of the, the exercises that I do with, with the people that I work with is I'll have them for five minutes, just close their eyes and say out their thoughts. It's something that they don't often do, but for five minutes, they'll start talking. And then I say, like a scientist, don't add any flavor to it or don't change it. If you notice a thought, say it out. And then I'll ask them at the end, I'll say, now try not to think of anything. But if you do notice something, a thought, and then say it out. And that, that's, that, that's the revelation that people get, you know, very quickly. It's like, wow, I'm thinking all the time. And I think that's really why the work that I'm doing in mindfulness coaches is so important. It's because it's trying to show you, like, you're almost living in this virtual prison almost this voluntary prison where you want to watch a YouTube video, for example, but adverts pop up all the time. You say, look, I want to watch this clip, but as soon as you start watching it, this advert pops up. And so you're, you're stuck in that advert. And then another advert, then another advert, and it's relentless and they don't stop. And so people that say, oh, well, I can't meditate because my mind's too crazy. I just have thoughts and I just keep thinking. It's like, well, yeah, it's actually very natural to keep thinking. And what, what I'm trying to show and what mindfulness shows is that you can't stop that thought from arising even if I paid you a million pounds. That thought's going to arise. But when it does arise, you can A, train your skill of awareness. Ah, I've noticed the thought arising. Okay, that's one part of the learning. And the second part is now that I notice it, I can do something about it, which I never knew existed before. So how did you get into that? And you're saying you, you didn't even know that they existed. How did you get into mindfulness? Yeah, so if you don't mind, a little backstory of course, that's on me. Of course, that's what we're here for. Yeah. Um, my father was heavy into philosophy. So he's Chinese from Hong Kong and into Wing Chun, Kung Fu, and my mother's French. And she passed away when I was nine years old because of breast cancer. And quite shortly after, my dad went to jail. So my sister and I, we were fostered into a family from the Caribbean. And very challenging times, you know, something that I now look back on and I'm very you know, grateful for that family. And there was a lot of love there. But I felt this sense of not belonging. And so in everything that I did, I always tried to fit in. And then when I went to, to university, I, I joined the Chinese society there, but I didn't speak Chinese and I didn't look Chinese. So I felt like an outcast. And so that inspired me to go to China and I went there to teach English for two years. The first year was in Inner Mongolia, where I was literally in that town in Huhot. I was like one of the, the only foreigners there, basically. And, um, rediscovered, you know, my, my origin story, met a lot of family. And then I got really interested in, in, into philosophy. Like my dad had shown me the way into Descartes and Descartes' Cartesian doubt, I think therefore I am, or the cogito ergo sum. And he would, he, he led me to this style of questioning, you know, how can you be sure that, that, that this is real, that you're real, or that that person in the street running is real? What if you're just a brain in a jar and this is all an illusion? And then it came to that revelation that Descartes points out that, you know, even if this is all an illusion and that, you know, you're a brain in a jar somewhere living this virtual experience, you need to exist in some shape or form in order to be tricked. And that was really like groundbreaking for me. And it just led me into this, 
into this path of wanting to find out well, why am I here? What is the meaning of life? What is happiness? Well, you know, what, what if this is a um, what if this is a virtual reality and this is not real? And then those questions led me to to start a podcast. I was listening to Joe Rogan at the time and just love these these range of guests that he had on talking about all these different subjects. And then one of the guests spoke about this thing called mindfulness. And then started reading about it. And then the more that I, I found that it's not just for people who are suffering from depression or not the people that are just, you know, want to have less anxiety. It was about understanding the nature of yourself, you know, who you are at the core, you know, without judging yourself and saying, I'm too fat, I'm too short, I'm broke, I'm white, I'm a man, I'm this, I'm that. It's like when all the thoughts stop, who are you then at the core? And then that was, that was the door that opened for me where I just started to, um, to fall in love with it and become quite obsessed. So if someone's quite new on this journey of mindfulness and self-discovery and spirituality, what, what would you say be, would be a good place to start getting more into this journey? Because I, I almost compare mindfulness practices similar to like fitness. Yeah. It can be very overwhelming to start with, but it's like you said, it's a very necessary part of life and it's something that you should be doing regardless of how it is that you feel currently. Because you, I feel like you want to be prepared when the time comes so you don't have to get prepared, you know what I mean? So you have the techniques and the yeah. practices in place already beforehand, before something happens. So let's say I'm listening to this podcast now and I just figured out what mindfulness is. Where do I start? I mean, there, there's so many wonderful resources out there now, free resources, guided meditations, but I like to start by saying, well, why? Let, let's, let's understand why is it that we're doing that? Why do we want to find out more? And then one, one of the first things I begin with is, let me go back to the students that I have and they, they say out their thoughts and we write them all down. Well, the next step that I have them do is I say, well, let's, let's apply a color code to it, meaning, you know, green, orange, and red. Green, meaning no anxiety was caused from that thought. Orange, a little bit of anxiety. And red, lots of anxiety. And most of the thoughts that we have are either unwanted, negative, or we call them unskillful. And those, those unskillful thoughts, or those are orange and reds, that cause anxiety, you're actually microdosing yourself with those, we, you know, the, the cortisol and the adrenaline, it's those fight and flight chemicals. So even you worrying about, you know, the bills that you have to pay or, or, the, or the meeting with your boss, your brain can't distinguish those stresses from something more serious, perhaps like a life and death situation. And therefore it produces chemicals that are appropriate for that kind of response. And so for example, that's, you know, let me give an example with the fighters that I work with. Those that are really worried about the fight the night before or the week before, they start secreting, they're producing like a drug factory. They're producing those fight or flight chemicals. So is that mainly cortisol? Adrenaline, cortisol, cortisol which, which have amazing effects when you need them. Like if you're ready to run away or to have a fight, excellent. But it's terrible when you're trying to get to sleep at night or when you're at the dinner table trying to eat with yeah, your- Yeah, and it can also decrease your testosterone levels, right? Which is very important to, to professional fighters in camp. Exactly, it kills your sex drive. It kills your appetite. It, you know, your, your vision goes from peripheral to very laser focused. So Which all I, the things you don't want during a fight camp, essentially. Yeah, all the things that you want during the fight. But the point I'm getting to is here, the more that you do this, the more that you deplete those resources. And so many fighters will tell me that my legs felt really heavy in the fight or my cardio was, you know, I trained cardio really well, but I felt gassed. It's because you may have the best cardio, but if you're really, if you're worrying and you're really nervous and you're secreting all those those fight or flight chemicals, you're, you're almost depleting yourself of that. So when you actually need them in the fight, you have a very low reserve. 
that's fascinating. So you say you work with a lot of fighters. That's obviously your primarily your primary sort of clients yeah. are fighters. And um, when most people think of fighters, right, they think of fearless, brave. But like you said, they they still encounter the anxiety because, of course, you're going into a fight, and and people watch UFC, they watch all of these all of these fight championships, and they don't realize that there's always an ever-present danger of injury, you know, career-ending injuries, mm -hmm. brain damage, or even death. Yes. So what are some techniques, like, like you said, that you use when a fighter comes to you and maybe he's an incredible fighter, but he just has no control over his nerves and anxiety? What's, mm -hmm. What are some of the first things that you would address with those people? Because I think that's something that we can all apply to, to our lives. Well, the first thing, you don't learn this overnight. It's like you don't go into a boxing gym and come out after day one and say, look, I'm a boxer. It's understanding. It's like going to the gym. It's a process that takes time. Um, so that, that's the first thing I'd mention. And the second thing I'd mention is that it's completely normal to have those nerves and the fear. I remember like famously like Chris Eubank would talk about like, you know, just the absolute fear or Darren Till in the UFC like looking to try and find ways to injure himself just before the fight, just so that he can get out of it because he's, he was petrified and he's in tears as he's giving this interview. You know, Anthony Joshua talking about the fear and the nerves. It happens to the best of the fighters. And yes. so understanding that it's completely normal actually, you know, helps people, okay, well, it's not just me. And the way that I explain it is like, okay, well, if we're gonna work on this, it's like, hey, let's do this to get an advantage, not only over your opponent, because in the fight game at the highest level, it's, it's the slightest differences that make all the difference. So how do we get an advantage over not only your opponent, but over your old self? You know, how would your old self help, have dealt with it? And so as to what we would actually do in that course, well, you know, there's many, way, many things that we, we will do, but one of them is affirmations, right? There's something where you, you give yourself a series of things that motivate you, like I am strong, I am fast, I am confident, and I am loved, I am proud. It's things that you can use when you notice the chaos and the fear and the nerves and the worry. It's like, well, I have a choice now, I can dwell on that, but with the skill of mindfulness, it's like, ah, I notice now that I'm having that negative thought, rather than 10 minutes later after you've been consumed by it and you're producing all those chemicals and you're feeling butterflies in your stomach. Mindfulness, how quickly can you notice that you're having that negative thought? So that how quickly then can you apply your technique, such as an affirmation? One of the things are visualizations. Visualizations are a powerful tool because it, you know, you prepare yourself for the win. You imagine yourself with your hand being raised. You imagine yourself walking out and hearing the sounds and the lights, enjoying the atmosphere, that has powerful tools. And then where mindfulness really comes in, it's breath work. It's, you know, what techniques can you use when you're short of breath? What, how do you breathe if you want to relax? How do you breathe if you want to hype yourself up? Because maybe just before a fight, you don't want to relax. You want to, come on, now's the time to go. How can you get yourself into the right mindset? Does it differ? Like what you just said, you know, sometimes before a fight, you want to be hyped up and you yeah. want to be very aggressive. But do you find that with some fighters, they do much better when they relaxed? Because I've noticed a lot that, you know, I've competed in like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and things like that. Some guys, they get on the mat, they get on the tatami and they're very aggressive. Yes. You know, they look like they're ready to tear someone apart mm. and then they end up dropping the ball. Or some fighters, they come in and they're very composed and very relaxed. Do you find that that, that there's a, is there an ideal mindset that you're trying to go for? Does that depend fighter to fighter and person to person? Like I said, not only have I worked with many fighters, I've interviewed hundreds of fighters on this very subject and it massively different differs from one fighter to the next. However, there are common themes that start to pop up and right? there's almost like different categories. There's those fighters that are excellent in the gym. Yeah. Right? They they feel within their comfort zone and they perform their best. Right? However, when they go into the ring, 
they can't reproduce that same performance. And their coaches and their, everyone else is looking at them like, why, what's going on? In the gym, he's so amazing. But, but now in the ring, he can't perform. Then you get the other kind of fighter that is, you know, in the gym, very average, very, you know, doesn't stand out. But in the ring, is able to perform their best. So that the, each fighter and every person is, is very different. But for both of those situations, which I described, there are ways in which to address that. That's very interesting. But going back to more, more of a common scenario for majority of people, because of course, not everyone listening to this is a fighter. Mm -hmm. If you're just a normal person, you know, let's say whether you're a student or you're just a young guy, beginning of your career, there's a lot of things that can make you anxious, right? There's deadlines, there's work deliverables. And even myself, I used to suffer very heavily from anxiety. What would be in your sort of first aid kit for anxiety to send to yourself and help yourself out in that scenario? So let's say, you know, there's obviously general anxiety that you feel throughout the day, some people more so mm -hmm. than others. Yep. But let's say you're having almost like an anxiety attack, something, you know, your boss just called you up saying, listen, we need to have a conversation in an hour. Mm -hmm. I need you in my office. And then all of a sudden you feel, you know, the cold yep. sweats are starting to kick in, the shakes, you yep. know, you're feeling very yep. light, you can't concentrate. Yeah. What would be the first thing you would tell a person like that to do to center themselves and help themselves out in that situation? Well, what I would tell them is what I do myself, because even though I'm a mindfulness teacher, I'm not exempt from those fears and those, um, all of a sudden something important comes up and I need to react to it. The initial fear and that initial is there all the time that doesn't go away but it's how you manage it so one of the things that i would do is if i know that i let's say my boss calls me and he says like you need to do this and you've got an hour or an hour we're going to have a meeting it's like i don't want to have to suffer for that hour leading up to it so how do i alleviate you know how do i alleviate myself right now so that i'm not letting this future event affect the way that I'm feeling right now because that's what we're really trying to do all the time like don't let something that happened before affect my happiness now don't let something that I'm about to do even though it's scary why should that affect me right now so what I try to do is I try and detract myself and switch my attention from the thought and the worry to being present and one of the ways that you can do that is breath work so there was a really interesting you know, video from Dr. Andrew Huberman, who's a, you know, a neuroscientist. And what a great example he gave was the, the physiological sign or the double breath. And it's one that I tell my fighters to do. It's when you're feeling really stressed and in that moment of like panic and attack and you do a series of breaths where you inhale and then before you inhale, you, you double it up and you take a second inhale and you're saying that like, you see like dogs do it you see children do it when they cry that <laughs> yeah and it, and it's I've, I've heard about a technique but i've never never connected that children do it then you're right and animals you, and you see yeah when you see, you see a child cry yeah, yeah. they do that <laughs> and then they yeah yep, so it's yep. almost like a subconscious mechanism that's been wired into our psyche but we don't you know we almost forgot how to use it Exactly. That's incredible now that you said it. Yeah. So just a little bit of information. It's like, okay, so when you notice that, that moment of, you know, deep stress and you want to, to reduce it and alleviate it, you can apply that, that the physiological style, the double breath. And, you know, you do it as much as you feel is necessary. Like if I'm doing it, I usually do 10, 10 in a row. So I'll, And the key is when you're doing it is to be really present to the breath. And by, by present, I want to be very clear. It's to fo focus all of your awareness and your sensation because what's going to happen as you're doing it is your brain wants to think about that scary thing. And the more scary it is, the harder it is for you to not think about it. And so as you're doing that, it's like, really be there as you're doing it feel where do you feel the sensation the most as you're doing that that's where your attention should be and as you're be with that breath there that's where i think like 
I know a lot of people have their different opinions and split opinions on it, but I do cold plunges every single morning. Yeah. I wake up, first thing I do, I go into my cold plunge. And um, a lot of people laugh at it and they're like, oh yeah, you're just showing off and blah, blah, blah. But the reason I always <laughs> show people that I do it because it's a very fundamental part of my morning routine because it centers me. And like you said, I start my day with mindful breathing because first thing you do when you get into a cold water, your body physiologically starts freaking out. Yeah. So you start, <laughs> mm -hmm. of course, when you get more used to it, it becomes easier. But the first thing I have to do when I get into a cold water is go mm -hmm. and center my breathing. So I think what you said about breathing is it's truly very powerful. And a lot of people are very unaware of how powerful breathing is to our, to our physiology as, as humans and to our, to our mindfulness. Yeah. Because, because we don't think about it. We don't think about breathing. It's like, you know, like right now you're driving, you don't really think about all the pedals, you press it and press it and everything. It's yep. just yep. part of our existence, but mm -hmm. it's such a powerful tool when you learn to harness it. And like you said, if you're a fighter, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're, you know, if you're a father, a housewife, it doesn't matter. I think every little helps, right? And that's why I think what you said about breathing is, is so powerful because it does help you get centered because you yeah. don't want to lose track of, of your breath and start freaking out and hyperventilating because again, that produces cortisol and adrenaline and all these stress hormones and then you're spiraling out exactly. almost and it's very easy. And to... not only that, but it's the thought that, that, that starts to arise. So when you go into a cold plunge, right, for the people that haven't done it before, they're new to it, the shock, not only is it cold on the body, but it, the brain starts to worry. Right? And rightly so, it's trying to protect you and it gives you all these reasons why you should come out. And so it may be a bit of fear. And so it's not, it's not only how you control your breath, but it's the ability to control the thoughts. You can't stop the, the scary thought from arising when you go into the plunge, but you can learn to control it. And so that's why, like, especially with the cold plunges, that's the combination. It's the breath plus the, the awareness of thinking. So we, we've been speaking about mindfulness for quite a bit, but I want to circle back a bit into your past, if that's, if that's okay. Obviously, with, with going through so many traumatic events as a child, yeah. how did you manage to turn your life around into such a positive example? Because obviously, before we started the podcast, we met you know, at, at your house and you have a beautiful family that you're raising and then you have beautiful hours and beautiful place. And coming from someone who, of course, lost their family at a very young age. Yeah. How did you grow into the individual that you are today? What do you think, what some of the principles that maybe you've used in, in creating this individual that you are now? Of course, you're an, yeah. you're an entrepreneur, you, you have your own business. Most importantly, you help people. So you live a, a, a selfless existence because you know, there are business people who create value, but it's very self-centered, right? Yeah. Whereas for you, you actually create value through helping people. So what would you think were some things that helped you break out from such a dark and negative place? Let me, yeah. you know, say quite frankly, into such a positive existence as a, yeah. as a man, as a father. Well, before, so before my mother passed away, my dad, there was lots of love, you know, and my dad taught me the piano, my mother, you know, taught me about reading and writing and speaking French it was my first language. And I had wonderful parents. And so even though I was nine and young, I'd already had like established, you know, some very strong principles um, about, you know, caring for other people, being nice to my sister. And then, you know, when the, my mother passed away, it was like, it was kind of put, you know, I have to be the man of the house now. You know, I have to, so I felt like a responsibility to look after my sister and a responsibility to, um, you know, to embody what I had been taught. And so I think that, that played a huge part in it. But like I mentioned, my dad was into philosophy. So that inspired me to want to, to learn. So reading and learning and, and trying to educate myself was a massive part of that. And traveling, traveling, my, my parents always took me around we traveled Hong Kong, we went to Spain all the time, to France and all around. And 
I can't understate how much I learned from meeting different cultures and realizing that even though in my foster family, we were in a rough area, we were in Halsden, you know, I got mugged quite regularly and it was quite scary as a young kid growing up. And, but knowing that as, as I traveled around so many countries, you know, in general, people are really nice. People are really friendly. And I wanted to, I wanted to, and I felt that I was like that as well. So I was learning to surround myself with positive people. And then I did a podcast for a charity called Action for Happiness. And one of their mottos was, you know, doing good feels good. So I agree. Yeah. I, I live by that principle and I, you know, whether it's selfishly or to help others, just being nice and doing good. It, you know, it's just a great way to, um, to be, great way to, um, to live your life. You mentioned that you spent some time teaching in, in Mongolia. In a, in, in a Mongolia, in so a like, Mongolia. Yeah, the most northern wow. province of China. And yeah. of course, that's a very unique and remote place. Are there any lessons that you picked up from people there that stuck with you throughout your life? Because of course, their culture is very different to our culture here. Yeah. Is there anything that you picked up that you adapted in your life currently? Anything that's all memorable? Because to me, that's very, very interesting as a life experience. Yeah, what what blew me away almost was the um, what blew me away was the respect people gave me as a teacher. Being a teacher in China is such a is such a highly regarded position, and just to see the way that teachers here are treated and you know the state is here, it's you know it, it's. It's, not, it's nothing special, right? And for parents as well, the way that students, you know, treat and talk about their parents. And, you know, we have so many homework exercises where we, you know, who's your inspiration? That's always the parents and it's always family. So that really stuck out to me because, you know, growing up in, in the UK, I hadn't seen that and the respect for teachers, that wasn't something. So that respect, that was something that I really, um, really took away from my experience there. Do you think that's what makes certain countries a lot more, I would say, resourceful and they, they have great progress when it comes to science and things like that? Like, you know, places like Japan, for example, they, they have very high levels of engineering and things like that. It's that respect for the art of learning, for the scholars, for the people that pass on the knowledge, right? Because <clears throat> In the olden days, like right now, I, I think we live in a society where not so much in the UK, but you see in the US all the time where someone goes old, they mm -hmm. get discarded. They get put into an old, exactly, old people's yeah. home, yeah. they get discarded. Whereas in a lot of other cultures, the elders uh, are normally the people that look after the children because they pass on the knowledge that they gathered throughout the years. And it's, it's a lot of the times when we speak to older people, you know is that even the ones that live relatively simple lives, mm -hmm. you know, in, in comparison, you know, they weren't some massive business people, or someone else that we acquire, you know, mm -hmm. uh, see as a high level person. They still have a lot of knowledge purely through the years that they lived, right? And yeah. I think that's what I agree with that you're saying that, you know, when society starts putting people like scholars and, and, and people that have a lot of knowledge to a high regard, I think that benefits everyone. And it is a shame seeing how teachers are very much disrespected mm -hmm. because I think there's also a lot of, you know, stigma towards learning and people saying these days. And, you know, I have two different kinds of people on this podcast. Some say that education is, or formal education, sorry, is pretty much a waste of time. And other friends of mine and guests on the podcast saying that it's very valuable. So. I'm assuming you you went through the UK educational system. Yeah. What do you think about our current educational system and, and maybe how, in your opinion, it could be improved? Yeah. Well, at the time when I went to university, which is, we're talking about 17, 18 years ago now, right? And I did part of my, part of my university here in the UK, in London Metropolitan, and I did a year in France. And that, for the time, I, th I thought it was great. I thought it was excellent. But now, 
you know, with, with the internet, you know, I come from a generation that lived before the internet. When I was at university, my laptop didn't have the internet. I just used it for Word. You know, that's, that's how ancient <laughs> that time is. But now when you look at, you know, for example, I mentioned Andrew, Dr. Andrew Huberman. And then you look at people like, people like Jordan Peterson and you look at people like Joe Rogan. And the way that we learn, the way that I have been learning in this, the latter part of my life has been so fun, right? I think- I agree. I, I think that's, what miss, that's what's missing from the education system. It's the fun and the excitement. Uh, just the other day, I was listening to you know, someone talk about communication. Doesn't sound that very interesting. And he's like, no, even when you're giving a speech, or he's like, he gave a simple principle, the what, so what, now what principle. So what is it that you want to say? Oh, I want to say this, all right. So what, why should be people interested? Why, you know, inspire them. And then now what, what's the call to action? Simple structure. But he talked about it so passionately and it was, okay, now I could, just from that one little podcast, I remember and I'll always remember that. And it was just such a fun way to learn about communication and I think nowadays, if I take that old curriculum, I look at now, especially with the amount of resources that we have at our fingertips and the way that we learn, and like even piano, like when my son learns piano now, he puts his iPad down and it teaches him exactly how to play. And then when he plays a note wrong, it notices it from the sound and he says, ah, you made a mistake. Let's go back. And then if you keep making that mistake, he goes, okay, well, here are a few drills that you can do to further that. I'm like, that's a beautiful way to learn. When I learned piano, it was just, I didn't enjoy, I didn't like my piano teacher and it was their way. And I just think there are so many fun and really amazing ways that we can learn that the current education system hasn't incorporated yet, right? And I have a maths teacher friend, he teaches at a college here in the UK. And he says, it's all about, you know, passing the Ofsted exam. It's all about making sure that the school gets certain awards and and passes these levels. That's where he's saying that that's where the downfall is. Rather than getting the students to be inspired and to learn, it's more about let's check all these boxes and fill it in. One thing that I really didn't like about the school system myself, and obviously I finished school probably about, you know, 10 years ago or something like that, which is pretty recent, is that I think the biggest flaw with our current educational system is that it punishes failure very harshly. And I think that what I've learned in my entrepreneurial journey, what I learned in my business journey, my fitness journey, is that failure is a necessary part of growth, mm -hmm. providing that you can keep going. And I think as a child, when you fail and someone then punishes you for failing, you get very scared of trying. Yes. And that's what stuck with me. And um, um, I don't want to swear on a podcast, <laughs> but I had to unscrew that, let's just use the word, yeah. out of my brain when I was growing as an entrepreneur because I was so worried of trying stuff and failing that I didn't even try it anyway, which by default makes you fail. Mm -hmm. And then what I was listening, again, why you have to listen, in my opinion, to podcasts and, and focus on self-growth and self-learning. I listened to one podcast and the gentleman on the podcast, I honestly can't remember who he was, said that the only way you can fail in most ventures is that you stop trying. Mm -hmm. So let's, I always use an example of driving. You know, if you have a GPS put in on your phone and you miss your turn, which means you failed, you missed your turn, you went the wrong way, your GPS doesn't then tell you, <laughs> okay, stop. Yeah. Finished, you're done driving. You failed, you took the wrong turn. Mm -hmm. No, it says, that's all right, you took the wrong turn. Maybe make a U-turn. Maybe try to find another way. Yes. And once I realized that, my whole outlook of so many things in life changed. It's like, let's start a new business. Something failed, that's fine, readjust. Mm -hmm. You want to get a better physique. Maybe you failed the diet, that's fine. Maybe that wasn't the right diet for you. Readjust. Exactly. Fighters, you know, in some fighting sports like boxing, for example, your record, it's very important. You don't want to lose a fight. But in MMA, we know is that, you know, there's some fighters who are legendary who had some, you know, streaks where they lost a few times. Yeah. Like um, a friend of mine, Modestus Bukowskis, he had a UFC fight against Khalil Roundtree, and he had mm -hmm. a he mm -hmm. took a sidekick, and which exploded his knee. Mm. So he got dropped by the UFC. 
he went through a very dark time in his life, you know, recovering from a pretty much a career ending injury for most people. You know, he's there at home, laying in his bed with a broken leg, drinking his sorrows away. But then he made a plan saying that he's gonna go back into fighting, get back into get back into into fighting shape, and then get back into into the UFC. And then he got back into the Cage Warriors. He won back his Cage Warriors light heavy light heavyweight belt. And now he's back in the UFC and it just shows you the power of perseverance, right? And not letting failure dictate you. But I think then we can circle back into mindfulness and that it's so important to to be able to control your own mind. And I think that's what mindfulness is. And that's why I think it's so important is that it's like mental fitness. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's it's like, you know, you don't want to start going to the gym when you're obese. You know, you want to keep going to the gym to stay in good shape and keep it up. And I think that's why meditation is so powerful and mindfulness is so powerful because like we spoke about this before the podcast, Ray Dalio, one of the greatest invest- investors in, in our current day in Wall Street, he says that meditating and mindfulness meditations were one of his pillars for success. Yeah. You know, so and and you see it amongst I think Tim Tim Ferriss who wrote um, who wrote the book about uh, millionaire and billionaire habits and how they get to that success said that a very large percentage of them I don't want I don't want to pull a number out of thin air but it was a very large number it was definitely over fifty percent have some kind of mindfulness practices yeah. but do you think that mindfulness should only be reserved to meditation or is there other ways that people can use uh to get into a state of mindfulness so, so, be, so mindfulness is a way of living right because i see the the 10 15 minute formal practice in the morning is like you doing your cutters or your wax on wax off or you're doing your drills so that you can apply it for the rest of the day where the real meditation is Life is a meditation. When you're feeling bored, when you're feeling anxious, when you're feeling, when you're walking down the street, when you're walking down the street, what, what is your intention? Is your intention to just let random thoughts come in your mind? Or do you want to think of three ways that you can be proactive or think of five, five ways that you can you know, improve your business? Most people say, well, I don't, I don't plan what I'm thinking when I'm going to go down, walking down the street. It's like, of course, most people don't. But then there'll be this, this thought, the to-do list, worrying about something, you know, you know, reminiscing about an argument that you had, rather than what is it that I want to think of right now? So in every moment, there's a choice to be mindful. And so I just, I just wanted to be clear that if you stop yourself at any time, you'll think, you'll notice, oh, I was thinking about this and thinking about that. And you were doing it almost blindly. Mindfulness is this skill that in each moment you can notice and make a choice do i want to be thinking that or do i want to be present do i want to be present with you right now think i gotta go home and i gotta feed the kids later on and these are thoughts that i notice in my mind but i can uh, i notice you but i'm coming back to be present in the conversations and it's a constant it's a constant skill of notice and this being distracted but i come back to being present to what i want to do i get distracted again and i come back to it and the formal practice in the morning strengthens me so that throughout the rest of the day where the real mindfulness is, or to use it as the fighting analogy, like in the morning, the 10, 15 minutes, I'm just hitting the bag. And then during the days, I'm I'm fighting people all day long. But I practice and I upskill myself so that I'm able to do that with my formal practice. Because life itself is the meditation. I've never heard anyone say that, but that's that's one quote that I think will stick with me, (laughs) saying that life is a meditation, because you're right. what mindfulness has given me and i don't want to sound all hippie wishy-washy but it's a real thing to me and i i'm very grateful to have the ability is to sometimes stop because i'm very much an active guy i'm a go-getter i wake up early you know i'm up before 5 a.m and i'm just hammering yep. and some days i might just be walking and it'd be like 5 a.m in the morning and i look at the sun just starting to rise and i stop for like five seconds i'm like I'm here and I'm yeah. getting to experience all of this right now. Yes. And you see that there's people out there on the surface, perfect life, beautiful children, beautiful wife, 
beautiful house, great career, great business or whatever. But because they never stop and think about it and give that gratitude to themselves, they never even appreciate it. And you get some of these guys that are depressed mm -hmm. and you almost want to say to them, like, look at your life. Like, look at what you have. And, and there's another quote that I've, I've heard somewhere. And I don't like comparing people's problems mm. because I think problems are very subjective and relative yeah, yeah. and a, something that might not be a problem to you at all mm. might be an incredibly bad problem for me. So oh, yeah. I don't like putting people down and saying your problems don't <laughs> matter. But mm. I also heard a quote once that some people would wish to have your problems. Yeah. They would do anything to have your problems. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Just, just in comparison, imagine right now you were stuck on a desert. You have no water, you have no food, mm -hmm. you're about to die. And someone says, would you want to teleport into the lowest point of your life when you were going through some big problem where you had all these other things, you had food on the table, and yeah. the only problem that you had is that you were about to get fired. Yeah. You would be like, yeah, of course, please take me to that moment. Yeah. And that makes you realize how some problems that we think are the end of the world mm -hmm. are not going to matter in a year, maybe even a month. Yeah. And that's why I have one tattoo that I have on my body. Mm -hmm. That's a big one for me. And I have it on my wrist so I can always look at it. It yeah, says right. Memento Mori. Yeah. And that's Latin for essentially, remember you will die. Mm. It's, it's the meditation of mortality that I look at every day when I'm about to freak out over something. Mm -hmm. Someone cut me off in traffic, you know? Yeah. Like right now we're driving, someone jumps into traffic and as a man, you know, you, you think you're this alpha male and you want to say, you know, yo, I, I wish you would stop. I wish I could stop yeah, and yeah. I'll kick your ass and blah, blah. Yeah. But then you think like, remember you'll die. Yeah. Like this doesn't matter Yeah. in the grand scheme of things. Okay, you're going to go beat him up. You both get arrested or you get beat up. Or it's an old granny. Yeah. You know, you, you, and it's, you exactly. and it's like it's an old little yeah, granny and yeah. you're like, you've gotten so frustrated and it's like, over nothing. And it's yeah. like in the grand scale of things, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But it's the things that uh, subconsciously, we realize that matter. We know what matters to us. We know that children matter. We know that love matters. We know that all these surface level things that we mask our problems with and we distract ourselves with, they don't matter because our inside voice tells us that. Yeah. You know, I'm sure when you hug your children, you know that feels right. Yeah. You know, and when you shout at them or you slip up in your character, you know it feels wrong. Yeah. So I think we all have that moral compass, but like you said, we don't listen to it because we're distracted and because we're not mindful. And because we're not taught how to. That's the thing, especially with my, my kids, when you say, you know, pay attention. I used to get that all the time at school, but no one teaches you how to pay attention. And it's the same in, when I have it as well, when I get cut off, I'm like, my initial reaction is like, hey, yeah, you got a snap, right? But it's then how quickly can you know, ah, there it is, and I, oh, I almost chuckle at it because it's like, ah. You catch yourself, yeah, exactly. I, exactly, and that's that's the beauty and of mindfulness because it's it speeds up that the time that you react, the yeah. thought comes up and it's like, ah, fight or flight, that, that has kicked in to the point where you can, ah, I notice it, now let me correct it. And that's a very hard thing to do, especially car situations because without you noticing, this is a fight or flight moment because at any moment, something could happen, right? That's yeah. why we're so quick to react. Yeah, I think it was Joe Rogan who said that he, he there was a study or something about why people road rage the way we road rage. Because if someone bumps into us on the street, we don't snap at them like that. Yeah. You know, if someone brushes your shoulder on the street, yeah. you don't snap at them. Yeah. But if someone almost brushes your car, yeah. you freak out. It's because at any point when you're driving, you can get seriously hurt. Exactly. We, get, we got used to driving, but it's an inherently dangerous thing. But yeah. Going back to something you said was about raising children and like disciplining them and getting them to learn. Mm -hmm. How do you, or so what are some of the practices that you use when communicating with your children to, to get them to listen to you, to teach them better, yeah. to be present for them? What are some of the principles that you can you use and other parents can apply to help their children? Well, first of all it's just don't force it i never i never try and force anything on my on my kids because i knew like especially with piano with my dad the more he forced it to me like the less i wanted to do it but just to, just let him watch me do it 
just let them when I'm you know when daddy's meditating and daddy's sitting down on his cushion sometimes they'll just come and sit with me and then my son now knows that you know every now and then he'll come in with me and we'll do like 10 breaths together and so it's to introduce them slowly to it and make it fun the stuff like with my with my daughter she's lying down just put a little teddy bear on her stomach and as she's breathing the teddy bear rises and falls a little bit and it's just to notice that and the thing is children as John Kabat-Zinn says they are the mindfulness teachers when they're playing games or when they're asking you something they're 100% there when they're playing games and they're running around they're not thinking about you know what we're having for dinner later on or paying this bill that's why it's beautiful to watch kids play because they are so in the moment and I think that's where a lot of our core memories and our nostalgic memories that seem so pure when you think about it come from childhood yeah. right so you know when you're older and someone says oh you know what's like your, the best day you had over the past you know a few years yeah a lot of us would probably answer with a moment from a holiday you know a moment from a party that you had when you maybe maybe you you are more materialistically minded which i don't think is always a bad thing maybe when you bought something or you got a gift or something yeah whereas when you're a kid yeah for me anyway the memories that i have the core memories are very simple yeah it's just when i was unapologetically present and happy yeah, yeah. maybe i was watching a cartoon Yes, maybe yes, it's yeah. the one time I played with my children. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the one time my granddad hugged me and mm -hmm. I just felt loved. And I think yeah. it's interesting that we go back to children a lot throughout this conversation because I think we almost, when we're born, we have this default operating system that's wired very much in the right way. And we mm -hmm. get taught and, and sort of put into this frame of thinking mm -hmm. that's good for a modern society but it's not necessarily something that's good for you as a human yeah. so one of the examples for example as a as a kid you have a lot of perseverance right when your parents you know or someone you with take you to a shop and you want to buy a toy yeah you ask can i have this toy mm -hmm. no you can't please can i have this toy yeah. no no we I can't it afford it, it and the time, then they yeah. keep pushing yeah. pushing and pushing and pushing and a lot of the times you go, be like, all right, just this one, go ahead, yeah. you'll get it. Because they have perseverance. Uh -huh. But as adults, we then go through the schooling system for everything and we get taught that if someone tells you no, just shut up, mm -hmm. stop it. And we stop chasing things the way we started off as, a, as children, you know? And I read um, a book by, I think it was uh, Grant Cardone, I think it was in his uh, 10X book, who's a, he's a big entrepreneur, big sales guy. He says that as a child, you have that unmatched perseverance. That's what you need as an adult to like succeed in business. Yeah. And he goes, a lot of the times you might get a no in a sales process, call them back. Mm. You know, call them back a day later, be like, hey, let me give you a better offer. Yeah. You know, they still say no. Okay, a week later, hit them up on email. Mm. And eventually they might be like, oh my gosh, this guy's really persistent. Yeah. But as a child, that's your default operating system. Mm. And it's funny to, to see that you know, you, you almost use that because you don't want to take those good properties out of children and drill something into them that's society deemed to be the right thing, right? Yeah. And that's, that I think is a very interesting take. Um, this is something that I like to uh, almost, you know, always talk about towards the end of the podcast yep. and we're almost approaching the hour mark. So I really wanted to touch on what is your future vision for yourself and for your self growth as a, as a mindfulness coach and what, yeah. what is it that you want to achieve in let's say 10 years time? What is your vision? Yes, yeah, so I'm very clear on my mission is help as many people as I can, right? Now, how I do that is kind of, I have like my left and my right hand column and it's like, in my left hand column, it's like, I, I want the, 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 the stuff that that a lot of people are chasing, like, you know, the money, the cars, and all this. I still enjoy chasing that, but as a secondary to my right-hand column. And so my right-hand column is better relationships and you know, making sure that I'm pursuing my passions, making sure that I'm helping people. And so I want to take my business now, my mindfulness business, which, as I mentioned before, is with the aim of 
which is burn from helping others. But I want to take it to a place where I can scale it, where I can give stuff away for free, where I can become a millionaire, where I can combine my passions, conversation, mindfulness, helping people, making money, and putting that all together to make something that I'm proud of that, you know, that can, that my, my children can continue if they want to. You know, leave a legacy behind of, you know, there, there's so much suffering in the world, right? We hear of depression, we hear of suicides, you know, year after year, it's okay, now it's a higher rate of mental health problems. More people are sad, I mean, whether it's social media that's affecting that. Mindfulness is the number one way people can reduce mental suffering and can improve mental health, bar none. And so it's, it's, my, it's my goal, it's my vision, it's my aim to, to, to help as many people as I can to, um, to be introduced to this technique. Yeah. It's not my technique, I didn't come up with mindfulness. It's just I want to be able to teach it. I want to make sure that people are, you know, at least people are aware that it exists. It's like to the gym, if people didn't know a gym exists and they didn't understand what fitness was and the benefits was, they wouldn't be doing, but then there was this gym revolution or the health revolution. Now everyone goes to the gym where yeah. everyone at least understands that if they want to be healthy, they can go to the gym. At yeah. least that option is there and they choose not to, or they choose to. I want to be in a bit, I want, you know, mental health and not only mindfulness, but there's so many other things that, that people, other contemplative exercises and tools that people can use to, to achieve similar ways. But I want people around the world to know that, yeah, you are suffering. It's tough being a human. Like you said, whether you're a famous actor like Robin Williams or Anthony Bourdain, or you're, you know, you're someone below the poverty line. Yeah, we all struggle. We all have thoughts all day long. And most of those thoughts are negative, unhelpful, unskillful. How do we learn to change the relationship and teach it in a fun way, like I was saying before? Make, make it exciting. Oh yeah, talk about the, the neuroscience as to what happens in the brain, how the, the, the links and you can create new pathways and how the chemicals and just as these create negative chemicals, when you spend time reflecting on something positive, being grateful, you can actually counter it and, you know, put good chemicals, counterbalance it. So make sure that it's available to as many people as possible and available in a fun and helpful way. So in order to help you achieve some of that, I want to ask you a question that I think will help a lot of people. And um, what advice would you give to your younger self? So let's say you're 18, 19 years old. Now that you live the life that you lived so far, what advice would you give yourself now that you know what you know? I would advise them to continue the pursuit of, you know, just being, you know, just to inquire and just to find out more because I've always had that and I would just encourage more of that. I wasn't aware of mindfulness or the, you know, that mental health side of things at that time because, you know, younger, am I, you're asking me when I'm a nine-year-old when I lost my parents because I would give them different information then, but just in general is to keep that fire and the desire to want to learn more and to, to be inspired. But then to add that second part of it, which is, but then go and help other people learn it as well. You know, it's like, I've, I've always been, yes, this is great and I want to learn more. But I think the bit that I would add to my younger self is now take that and help other people be inspired and help other and people learn. Also, I think there's no better way to learn something it's than if you need it. to teach it. Yeah, of course, of course. Because then you need to understand it down to the real fundamentals. Yeah. And I also can't let you go without asking for a much more serious thing is that if someone is watching this and they're in a very dark place and I believe that the goal of this podcast whether it gets 50 views 50,000 or 50 million views is that if we help one person for sure yeah. then it's time all spent so if someone's watching this and they're in a really dark place yeah they feel like there's not really much hope mm -hmm. every day feels mundane you know they feel like they're depressed and they just feel like life is pretty, pretty hopeless. Yeah. What advice would you give them to, to help them in that situation? Yeah, I would start off by, by saying, A, this is not as uncommon as they may think. So many people are going through that in different forms. And just like with physical builds when we're born, there's a whole spectrum of baseline. There. And those people that feel like they're probably, you know, on low baseline. And secondly, it's that, 
whether they like it or not, they're thinking all day long. And so a lot of that self-doubt or that negativity and that desperation and that, that negative stuff, they couldn't stop those thoughts whether they, they tried to or not. So if they learn something like a mindfulness where it's like, let's get more skillful in managing these thoughts. And the more that you manage them, the more, oh wow, I didn't realize where you play more of an observer role rather than experiencing the thoughts. The fact that you sit down and you, you, you observe and you, med you observe the thoughts, I noticed that thought when you become the observer rather than experiencing it. It's like, am I the fear or am I the witness to a fearful thought? You know, am I the anger or am I just witnessing an angry thought? Uh, yeah, that's... So, that's... Just, so just to finish my, yeah. my point on that is that we all do it, we're thinking all day long. Learn, before you make any decisions, understand why is it, where do the thoughts come from? Understand that they are relentless and then can you do anything about it? And once you just start that inquiry and you go down that road, it may open your eyes to this whole new way of living and seeing life through a mental, a new mindful lens. Yeah, and I would like to add as well that if you are in a place like this, reach out to people you trust. And if you feel like you don't have people that you can trust, reach out to the services that are available out there. Go on Google, look up. I'll drop some numbers down in, in, the, in the video there down below. Because you're worth the life that you're given and whatever you do, there's always hope. Believe me, trust me, like you said, a lot of people been there yeah. and you can't give up. So let's end on that very positive note. I think it's been an incredible, incredible conversation. I've, yeah, I've learned so a lot. Yeah. I've gained a lot of insights from yourself and I wish you all the best, Guy. And how can people reach out to you if they do want a more personalized help from you? Yeah, so if people want to find out more, they can go to my website, mindfulnews.uk. And I've got podcasts there, I've got meditations, and it's linked to the courses and stuff. And I give away a lot of stuff for free. And yeah, that's the best way that they can reach out to me. Thank you so much once again. It's been an incredible experience and we wish you all the best. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you Cheers. very much. Cheers. Thank you.